Hi, welcome back to this series where we will build an entire GraphQL API and a React frontend connected to it. Now, we started working on the GraphQL API. We'll build an event booking um, API. So we got events and we got users thus far. We got our API schema, which, um, well, allows us to interact with that. But there are still some features missing and there are some things we can polish about this API as we currently have it. I'll work on this in this video, and in the next video of this series, I'll then work on the actual bookings, which we can uh, make or which we can make as a user of this event booking service. So let's dive into the polishing and the completion of the API as we currently have it. Now, obviously there are more missing features, but about the API as we currently have it, there's one big thing that misses. And that is our relation between users and events. In our mongoose models, which have no direct effect on the API, I really want to emphasize that. In these models, we see that we have for a user, a list of created events. And in that list, we store, uh, well, a list of um, event IDs. And for an event object or an event entity in the database, we have that creator field, which is a single um, user ID. Now, currently, I can't fetch that data through the API. And that is the first thing I want to change. So here, for my event type, I want to add that creator field. And that will return me a user object. That is the idea. And a user is defined as it is down there. And for a user, on the other hand, I will have uh, the created events field. And you could pick different name than you have here in your mongoose schemas, but I will use the same names. And the created events field should return me an array of events. Um, this may actually be null if a user hasn't created any events yet, but, the, but if it has data in there, then it has to be an event object and not a null object. So now we updated this and we can now try to, to use that. So here in graphical, I'll now send a query to the events endpoint. And there, let me fetch the creator. And I need to reload that page to get um, auto completion. Now let me get that creator. And there, let me get the ID. Now, this works here in graphical because it fits my GraphQL schema. But if I hit enter, I get this ID cannot represent value error. Okay, so let's try with the email of the creator. Here, I actually get another error that I cannot return null for a non-nullable field user email. Now, what's the issue here? The issue is that whilst I do say that an event has a creator, which is of type user, whilst I say that here in my schema definition, this is not what I actually return in my resolver. Because for events here, I do return my event, my event objects as I do fetch them from the database. But we always have to keep in mind that in the database, there is no complete user object stored in a single event. Instead, creator is simply holding the ID of the user. So all I'm returning here is an event object where the creator field has the ID of the user. The creator field is not an object with the user email or anything like that. And therefore, when I try to query for that, it is uh, certain to fail because I can't get the email if all I get back from the database is in the end a single uh, string. So this will actually not work here. As a consequence, we have to adjust the data we return here. And we should make sure that the events we return actually do have all the user information. For that, I obviously need to fetch information for the user who created the event. I can use a feature provided by Mongoose to get this additional data. I can find, and before I call then, I can add populate. Populate is a method provided by Mongoose to populate any relations it knows. And Mongoose knows a relation by this ref key. So here, creator for an event has that ref key. So when we now call populate, Mongoose goes and visits that um, 
collection or that model we're pointing at here on the ref key and tries to pull in all that extra data from our database too for the given user ID, which is actually stored in this creator field. So therefore here I can populate. I just have to tell Mongoose which field I want to populate and that would be the creator field. So it should look into that field and see if it can find a reference there. And now with that, if we save that, it will restart. And now let's try that again. Let's try to fetch the email for the creator. And there it is, this now works. Now if I try to fetch the ID here, I get the error we already know from the past videos. This is related to how the ID is stored and that it is this object ID object which um, is not understood by GraphQL. And we could fix that by going into our returned object and overwriting the creator. And there I actually want to get all my event doc creator data or of the creator document. But I want to override the ID and set this to event doc creator ID without the underscore to use that built in ID virtual getter provided by Mongoose. Now if I hit enter, this looks much better and the other fields also should still work. So now we are populating our event data. Now, obviously, we could now say, okay, we get a creator here. A creator has created events and created events are events with a title and so on. But if I hit enter, we face the same problem because now we did populate our event with the rich user data for the creator field, but then that extra user data that was pulled and merged into the creator field by Mongoose, that still has the created events field then, but that again is just an array of um, our IDs of events. So Mongoose does not recursively kind of populate this. And this is good because we would enter an infinite loop because if Mongoose would now populate all the created events there, well, then we would again have events with a creator field. And if Mongoose would populate this again, then we would have the created events again and Mongoose would have to populate this again and you see where this would be going. And therefore, this is not necessarily the best approach I can think of because we can only add a certain amount of nesting and we don't have the full flexibility of querying as deep as we want. And therefore, to get this flexibility, I will actually implement this uh, merging manually with a more flexible approach. And for that, I will add a function here in my uh, app.js file and I will name this function user. Now this will be an arrow function which receives an user ID as an argument. And then here I will return user find by ID to find uh, a user by that ID in my database. So by that user ID. And here I will then have the then and catch. And if I have a problem here, I will throw an error. In the then block, however, I will have my user data. And there I simply want to return user doc where I overwrite the ID. So just user ID here. With that, I have all the logic to fetch a user by its ID. Now I can use that user down there where I want to get data for my creator. We can now get rid of the populate uh, method here. And instead here on the creator, I can point at my user function. So keep in mind, user here is really just pointing at this constant, uh, not at this, at this constant here, which holds my um, arrow function in the end. So I can point at this function down there. And I just need to make sure that the argument is passed in so that this user ID is passed in. And I do this with the bind method. And the second argument I pass there will be the argument received in the user function we defined um, above. And there I will pass in my event doc creator field. And that will be um, that object ID which Mongoose retrieved from the database. Now let me save that and let's give this a try. Uh, we still will not be able to get uh, access to the created events yet. But if I hit enter like this, this still works. And for my events, I can get the email ad address of my creator.
So this proves that my manual population approach here works. Now, the cool thing is I can now also add another constant, which I'll name events. And there I expect to get multiple event IDs. And here I will then return event find. And there I will look for all events where the ID and now here comes some special MongoDB query syntax where the ID is in dollar sign in that is a special operator understood by MongoDB in a, in a list of IDs. So I basically write a query where I want to get all events where the ID of the event is one of the IDs defined in an array I'm passing here. And that of course is the event IDs array which I expect as an argument. So here I can then find a list of events uh, basically all events that have their ID in that pool of IDs I'm getting. And there I then also have then and catch and I might have an error which I just want to throw. In the then block I know I have a couple of events and there I just want to return my events in a mapped version to um, transform each event and basically uh, return a new object for every event in that array, get my doc data, but then also uh, overwrite the ID like this. And importantly, overwrite the creator field to make sure that there I point at user, so at my function down there, which I can, thanks to hoisting. So I point at user, bind this and then there I want to pass this um, creator field. So event.creator. Okay, so basically here I'm just setting up that my creator property does not hold a single value, but instead will call a function when I try to access it. And for my user down there, I will also make sure that the created events field, which I have, will also not return its value, but instead will point at my events function here. And why am I doing this? I'll explain it in a second. So here I'll point at events and I'll just make sure that I bind so that the event IDs are passed as an argument. And here the event IDs can be found on user, doc, and then there it's the created events field. So why am I doing this? Why am I replacing created events and creator with functions? Because the way GraphQL works, whenever through an incoming query, I try to access a certain property, this will actually see if the property is a value like a string or a number and it will just give me that value or if it is a function. And if it is a function, it will call that function for me and return the result of that function as a value for the property I tried to query. So that is a flexibility we have in GraphQL. And this now allows me to model relations in a highly flexible way. Because now down there where I get all my events, I make sure that the creator points at that user function. So when I access this creator in my GraphQL query, we call that function or GraphQL calls that function and gives me the data returned by that function. The, re the data returned by the user function happens to be this uh, rich object with all the user fields and with the created events field. And if I drill deeper into that and I want to get access uh, to the created events and fetch some event data, then this function would get called and therefore it would execute this function and give me that rich event data, where again I could drill deeper into the creator. Now this is not an infinite loop because these functions are not executed as long as I don't request that specific value on this specific level. And therefore now if I save that and it reloads, we can reload here and I can still get the email for the creator, but I can also get the created events and there get the title. And you see this works. And I can now for all these created events again get the creator email. And this now also works. And now I can drill into this without entering an infinite loop. And this gives us all the flexibility we want or we could need. So if I now add another event, uh, not a user, an event with event input, and this will be added for the single user I have because I hard coded that user ID in my backend, another event, and I give this a description, 
this is just another test. And I give this a price of 999, uh, 999.99. And I also give this a date of, let's use the good old developer tools again real quick to get that date. So here I'll just call new date to ISO string real quick. Now I have that date string. And let's insert this here. And here I get back my created event and I will actually also have access to the user who created this. If I hit enter, I get an error for the user email. Okay, let's try without that and investigate this in a second. So this generally worked. Now let's again get all our events here. And for the events, let's get um, the title and let's get the creator. And for the creator, let's get the email. And this now works for multiple events. And I have another event twice because of that error. I created it twice. But this now works. This gives us this gives us all the flexibility. Now, regarding that error I mentioned, well, there um, the problem was simply that for create event, we also return an event in the end that created event. And the problem here is that there I'm not using that creator uh, functionality. So when I assign a value to created event, which I'm doing here, then I also, of course, need to make sure that I replace creator here with user and then bind this to result because result here is the variable holding that event data in this place. Result doc creator. And now we will actually also enrich this here. And now if I do create an event again, so if I go back to graphical and I do create another um, event here with create event, event input, and there let's insert a title. This should now work. Let's add a description. It really should. Let's give it a price of 29.99 and a date of that same date string I used before. Now I should be able to drill into my creator here. Yeah, and this now works. And this now proves that we got this rich merging going on. Now, thanks to the capability of GraphQL of not just returning values like strings and numbers, but also using values um, that are functions because the GraphQL parser, the package we're using here, will then execute the function and use that return value. And this is an extremely important part of GraphQL, which gives us a lot of flexibility and power, of course. Now to end this video here, I actually want to clean up my files because we have that large app.js file. Now I want to start moving to a different structure and I will add a new folder, GraphQL. You could name it differently. And in there, I want to have my schema folder and I want to have my resolvers folder. And in that schema folder, I'll add a index.js file. And in that index.js file, I basically want to export um, my schema. We can further split this up later, but for now I just want to basically export this call to build schema here. So I'll cut it out of app.js. Remember that we also will need this import. And therefore in index.js, I will import build schema, uh, not from, uh, but by requiring GraphQL like this. And this is using the destructuring syntax, the object destructuring syntax. And then here I will module exports, well, basically what I had in AppJS before, build schema with our schema definition string. And in the resolvers there, I will add an index.js file too. And later we will add more files, but for now I'll go with one file at least. And I will now grab my root value. So this object here, I will grab that and we'll move that into that resolvers file. There I will module exports this. But of course here we also have a couple of dependencies which we need. First of all, I need to grab my events and my user function here from app.js which I use in my resolvers. So we should insert this here as well. And of course we need a couple of imports. For example, we need the imports for bcrypt we need our event and user import. So I can 
cut that out of app.js and move it into the index.js file in the resolvers, like this. And in app.js, I can also remove the build schema import here, of course. So now we just need to make sure that we import the things we now outsourced into other files back into this file here. For that, well, I simply add a couple of imports in app.js. I'll name this GraphQL schema. The name is totally up to you. And I will require, uh, well, basically what I get from the GraphQL folder and there from the schema folder and there from that index file. And it will also import the GraphQL resolvers by requiring that from GraphQL resolvers index.js. And now I will bo use both here. So here I have the GraphQL schema and for the root value, I have the GraphQL resolvers. And now this makes this file a bit easier to read. Now it crashes, let's see what's wrong. Uh, yeah, the import paths of course are wrong. Here in the resolver, the models are now actually two levels above where they previously were. Now this looks better. And now if I go back and I reload graphical, let's see if I go for the events again. Doesn't look too bad. So this works, I'm not done yet though. This is a great first step. Now one problem I have is for example, if I fetch the date here, um, this is just a string which looks like that. It's not actually a readable date. Now that is due to the fact that the date is stored as a date object in MongoDB. But when we then parse it back into a string, this does not yield a readable date. And that is of course our responsibility to change this. Therefore, in the places where I do fetch my events, there I now want to, uh, well, also replace the date field by accessing my date, but I'll wrap this into a new date call, and then I'll call to ISO string to create a date string that is more readable than what we had before. And therefore, I will also do that down there, of course. Here, I also need to replace that with event doc date, um, wrapped a new date with two ISO string. And also, when we create an event, there for the created event, I should also do that. And yes, you could refactor that for sure. I'll uh, keep it like this for now. But with that, if I now fetch this again, we should have a more readable date. Yes, this is looking great. Now, last but not least, there's one other thing we could do, and that is we can use async await, of course, instead of this promise syntax with then and catch. And this is 100% optional. You don't need to use async await, but you can. If you wanna use it, it's relatively easy. Here in the res resolver, for example, here for this events function, you add async in front of the function, so in front of your argument list. And then inside of the function, you don't need to return this anymore. Uh, it will be returned implicitly because in an async function, you always return um, your topmost promise, so to say. So instead here, we just need to await this now, of course, and this will make sure that this also gets returned. This of course also means that we no longer use then like this. Instead, we await our events like this here. So we get rid of this line now. And if async await is a syntax you don't know, obviously you should uh, learn this first, but the core idea is that we can transform this code into a way that looks like it runs synchronously, even though it still doesn't, it still uses a promise behind the scenes, just a different syntax. But now I await my events here. That means that in the next line where I return events um, map, um, I don't do it like this. I will just call map here. I will just map it like this. And how do we handle errors? Well, now we do this with try catch. So I will now simply wrap this block here with a try block, and then I can catch any errors we might get and then execute the error handling code like this. And let's remove that closing parentheses. And now I successfully converted this first function to use async await. Now, one thing I need to do here at the end though is here I now need to return events. 
So to make sure that we return something GraphQL can consume, otherwise it uh, waits for it to complete, but we return no value. And now if I run this query, this looks good. And if I now dive into the created events and I get the titles here, this also looks quite good. Perfect. So this works. And now of course we can convert this to use async await to this user function. Just as before, I now get my user here by awaiting for this, can remove that and remove this pair, wrap it in try catch. Catch that error we might be getting. Get rid of this line and of this closing parentheses. And now here I also use um, try catch. And here I already am returning this. And this is exactly what I need to do. So this looks good. And now, of course, we can also do it down there. So here I can also add async in front of this function, which I map to my events key here. And then here I get my events. I can await for this. That means I can get rid of this line here. I still map it down there like this. I get rid of that here. We should wrap this with try catch still. So let's add this here, catch any errors, remove that line, remove that closing single parentheses. That looks good. And now also when we create an event, then can also turn this into async function. Here, I will await event save and this will give me the result which I want to store in a constant. So now we remove that then block here, get my created event where I use that result. Let's get rid of this. And in the next step, I want to not return user find by, but instead await user find by here. Get rid of this then block, of course have our check here, push, and then also here, get another result. And here I'll name this user save result because I already used the constant result um, above and now the scoping is different than before. So here I will now await user save, get rid of this, get rid of this here. Actually, we don't even need to store this in a constant. We're not using the result anyways. So let's instead write all that code like that. Let's also use try catch and wrap all that code up to the catch statement in a try block. And then open the catch handler, remove that closing parentheses. And I now converted this to async await too. By the way, if this is too fast, you of course find that finished code attached uh, to this video or in a link in the video description. Last but not least, I'll also um, set async, uh, the discrete user function to use async await. So here I'll get my user by waiting for the result of find one. Don't need the then block here, therefore remove that as well. Here I get my hashed password by awaiting for bcrypt hash. Get rid of this then block, therefore get rid of this. Here, I want to get my result by awaiting for the result of user save. Whoops, and there I accidentally removed the closing parentheses of my user constructor. Don't want to do that. Let's get rid of this down here. Let's also, just as before, wrap this all in a try catch block all the way to the catch uh, statement here. So catch the error, get rid of this line and of the closing single normal bracket. And here I might have a, a typo. Yeah, password should have two S's. This looks now better, but there seems to be an error somewhere. User has already been declared. Uh, yeah, here I'm fetching my user. And then I recreate that user object. So I will just rename that first user to um, existing user in these two places. Now if I save that, that looks better. It recompiles. And now let's quickly check that all. Let's add a mutation where I create a user with my user input, which has the email test2. Or let's first of all create one with an email address that already exists. 
Let's get the ID. Now I get user exists already, which I should. Uh, a new email address does work. Now let me create an event and I will create this with event input. There I will add a title. This is a test. Description should be um, user2 and I will actually copy the email, uh, the ID of that user we just created because I wanna hard code that into the code now so that we have different users for the different events. So first of all, let's add a price here, 39.99 and a date. I'll fill that in in a second. First of all, I'll go back to my code and in all the places where I hard coded the user ID and we'll change this later. But where I did do that, I will paste in that user ID of the newly created user. So that would be here in the create event function. And I'll restart this. And now here on the front end, I'll again create my date. Whoops. I'll create my date string real quick. Copy that and move it in here and get back the title. User is not defined. Now looking into the MongoDB um, Atlas database, I see that this event was created, however. So this user is a not defined method here it has to be stemming from the code which I just changed here. And actually there the problem is that I use user as a name again. Um, that obviously clashes with the user function I define up here. So to solve this problem down there, I will simply name this creator here. And in all the places where I used user, I'll use creator only in that function if I now save that. Let's uh, rerun that query. That looks better. And now we should have that um, event with this is a test and user two as a description. We should have that in our collection twice because I now, well, basically ran that query twice. Yeah, there it is. And this now all seems to work. Let's approve this by running one final query. Um, a query here where I get all events and there I want to get the titles of all events and from the, of the creators, I want to get the email address, let's say. Let's execute that and here we actually see the different users. Here we have different, different email addresses. And this now all seems to work. This was a pretty complex uh, video, I guess, especially with this dynamic GraphQL can use this as a function and get the value thing. But this is a core feature of GraphQL and really powerful as you can tell. And combined with the code, which is now at least a bit more organized, I'm really liking the progress we made thus far. This was a huge step forward. Definitely dive into my source code, which you find in the video description to uh, have a look at it in detail in case I lost you somewhere. Otherwise, of course, I hope I see you in the next part too.